Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 330 of our TIC Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is Psychiatric Superhero, an interview with Dr. Rosalie Greenberg. My name is Debbie Kimberg. You may remember me from episode 293. I'm also author of a soon-to-be-released book entitled Our Hijacked Brains, A True Story of Infection, Autism, ADHD, and Psychiatric Issues. And I'm Richard Johannesson. I'm excited to share with you the interview. And I had three takeaways from our discussion. One, you're going to love listening to Dr. Greenberg, who is warm, dynamic, and extremely honest. Two, she's a pioneer in recognizing that Lyme can be an underlying problem for so many of the kids that she sees. And three, she's at the forefront in identifying children with Lyme-related psychiatric issues. Without further ado, please meet Dr. Rosalie Greenberg. Hey, Dr. Greenberg, and welcome to the Tech Boot Camp Podcast. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. And we are really delighted. And I know many of our folks are going to be excited to learn more about you and your good work. I mean, you are one of the most well-known bloggers on the uh, LymeDisease.org site. And of course, you're, you're working in a niche that is really unique, certainly to this podcast. So I know folks are really, really excited and looking forward to this. But before we go into that, I do also want to introduce folks to my co-host, Debbie Kimberg, who folks know from uh, episode 293 of our podcast, one of the smartest people we've ever interviewed. So Debbie, say hi to the folks. No, stop, Rich. Hi, everyone. And I'm <laughs> so excited to be here and speaking with Dr. Greenberg today and uh, looking forward to a great conversation. We are too. And, and, and folks, you should know that Debbie is working on her book. She's getting closer and closer to finishing her book. So that's another exciting experience that uh, we're all going to enjoy together. And I promise everyone will have Debbie back when uh, she's ready to publish her book so we can have a preview of that book for you. But I digress. So Dr. Greenberg, talk to us a little bit about your work. Where are you currently working? And then tell us a little bit about your background, your educational background, and some of the work you did before you moved into your private clinical practice. Have you got 12 hours? Um, uh, we, we do, we do. The question is, do you have 12 hours? I may, but okay. Uh, well, let's see. I work in Summit, New Jersey, and um, I have a private practice. The practice is basically like what you call a tertiary psychopharmacology practice, which basically I see the kids that are hard to diagnose and hard to treat. Um, that you may often see in an academic center. So they've seen a lot of people. And I'm kind of the expert that they come to to hopefully give them some answers. Um, I attended medical school at Columbia, uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons in New York, uh, which is now, I think, the Vilagos College of Physicians and Surgeons. Um, then I did my adult psychiatry training at Columbia. Then I did my child psychiatry training at Columbia. Um, I worked on the uh, faculty for a year, uh, assistant director of their child outpatient program and their child inpatient program. Um, and then I stayed on the voluntary faculty, but then I went and worked for a private psychiatric hospital for a while and was director of their outpatient service and um, then went into private practice. But my, I was very blessed and that's really how I view it, okay? I trained at Columbia just when psychiatry was becoming more biologic and less Freudian and everything else like that. So I trained with a bunch of the pioneers, which was really lucky. I mean, one of my supervisors, Kim Bajantic, he's the guy who put pediatric depression on the map. And, and he was able to show that a lot of the biologic aspects that you see in adults, you see in kids. Um, quite frankly, I read more EKGs during my psych training uh, during my, than during my uh, general rotating internship because we, we were really very biologically based, okay? And I remember we used to have people used to sit there, the experts in my field and say, do you really think kids get depression? And now nobody would question that. And I saw my first bipolar kid in around 1980, okay? So I knew they 
So there's a lot to unpack here, and uh, since uh, since we're we're uh, we're going to be spending twelve hours together, let me get to some of the stuff I want to unpack as early as possible. So sure. let's, let's uh, one of our one of our favorite guests uh, in the past was a psychologist named uh, Leo Shea, Dr. Leo Shea. Sure. Um, and one of one of the arguments that Dr. Shea made to us was that every psychological disorder has a biological foundation. Do you agree with that? And is that consistent with the training that you had received and now the experience that you developed, or do you have a different perspective? In my gut, I believe that. Um, I mean, the true psychiatric disorders, it's not like there's schizophrenia caused by infection and there's just schizophrenia that just appeared just because of your genes. Everything is an interaction of multiple factors. It's a very exciting thing. But that's how the body is. It's so complex. So I do believe in the biologic roots. That's what that's what I was saying. The guys I trained with were the people who showed that gee, in depression, your cortisol uh, cycle is abnormal. I mean, that guy was my supervisor. We'd meet once a week and he'd talk to me about cases. Talk about being blessed. Okay. So and and, and also I was at the place where they were writing the first DSM three. We were part of the field trials. And that is when psychiatry tried to be more scientific. Okay, so in terms of increasing communication throughout the world, that we're all talking about the same thing with, would you say, schizophrenia? Well, that's what I was trained with. We were the guinea pigs to see, gee, is it good and is it bad? So, like I say, I was very blessed. And not that people didn't talk about dynamics or family interactions. I mean, all these things are so important. But like I said, I, you know, like a kid in candy store, I had, I was just so lucky. So throughout my career, I've always taken a more biologic approach. Your mother really doesn't do everything to you. Okay. And so I know it's hard to believe, um, but they're just not that powerful. And so I would always follow what you call state of the art in child psychiatry. And so, I mean, I would get acquainted with many different thought leaders. Um, I mean, I've written a book on pediatric bipolar disorder. I wasn't, I, wasn't, I guess I am known as an expert in that area. Um, and that made perfect sense to me in terms of, I told you, I saw one, you know, people say, does it exist? Well, I remember this kid. Absolutely. There's no question in my mind. So, um, again, and also once you, people think you're the expert, you become the expert. Okay. I mean, cause the more you see, the more you really get to understand a disorder. And, um, and the kids I see, they're wonderful. They're nuts, but I say that in a very loving way. I mean, because they're You fun. feel the love. Oh, well, because they're fun. Who hears stories like what I hear? I mean, really, you just don't. Um, so, again, um, how lucky I am. You are, you, and how lucky are all of we that, that you came from a place where you were given a certain set of training and you worked within a certain set of of frameworks that allowed you to now move to the to the arena where you're treating children uniquely but let's pause there for a second because we, we we're going to walk we're going to walk this one step at a time and i want to talk to you about another thing that's important in this community from the standpoint of the expectations that people have when they go to a doctor's office and what they should or shouldn't be um uh, expecting so let, let's let's first distinguish what is the difference between a research doctor and a clinical doctor good point um research doctor just means that you're studying things and it may be that you're studying rats to figure out biologic concepts on the other hand there is clinical research where you're looking at patients and looking at numbers of patients and trying to understand a disorder, phenomena, whatever. Somebody who is a true clinician 
really just sees patients. And that's not a just, that's a major thing to do. Uh, and a lot of work. But right. so, so you've been off on all three pieces of the divide. You've done research, you've done clinical research, and you've been a clinician, correct? Well, I've actually, I've done clinical research. Um, to say I've done research, I mean, I helped in some stuff about pheromones and uh, rats or whatever they were, but that doesn't count. Okay. Okay. So, so now let's, 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 from the standpoint of what people should expect when they come into a doctor's office, mm -hmm. right? There are going to be some limitations on what a doctor in a clinical setting is going to be permitted to do for a patient, correct? Because a doctor must be using generally accepted medical practices mm -hmm. when someone walks into your office. And, and what that essentially means is that the researchers, whether they be pure researchers or clinical researchers, are going to have to essentially clear frameworks that you're going to be permitted to use when someone comes into your office. I mean, I think that that is pretty much true. It goes by the individual that you see. I mean, people say, well, wait a minute, why are you treating, you know, I just treat kids under age 14. And people say to me, why do you do that? And I say, because many people are afraid to medicate younger than that. And um, not that I'm running to medicate an eight-year-old. That's not true. But if a kid is hurting and a kid is sick and a kid needs it, you got to do it. Okay. So, 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 but let's talk about that now, Dr. Amber. So we, we, we have a very experienced Ivy League educated doctor who is now going to be asked to look at someone who is outside of the norm, right? We're gonna, we're gonna have people who are gonna fit into the 80% of the bell-shaped curve. And, mm -hmm. and, and there are doctors who are gonna be comfortable treating the patients that are falling within the, 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 the general parameters. And then we're gonna have outliers, right? And it's going to be a lot more risky to treat an outlier than it is going to be treating someone who fits within the general parameters of the bell-shaped curve. And there is a, there hasn't been a lot of research done on children and, 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 and TBIs and Lyme disease and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and psychiatry, right? So in, in psychology, so, so it, it is going to be a very small select group of you who have medical licenses who are going to be willing to take the risk that has to be taken to treat the outliers, right or wrong? Well, I think it's right in a sense, but you know, you're taking risks, but you're also being very careful. Okay, I would never put a child on a medicine that is brand new, that hasn't been used in some work on children. Um, you know, they're kids, their work's in progress. You right, but, but, most, but Dr. Greenberg, most people, when I say risks, most people won't treat them at all, right? Because it's not, it, 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 they're, when I say risk. It, well, they think it doesn't exist. So well, if it doesn't okay. exist, why treat it? Well, but but no, it's it's easier to believe that it doesn't exist because it's safer for you as a practitioner. Because in the end, when people are coming into a doctor's office, they're coming into a business, right? Let's just be honest. We're coming in, we're coming into a business, and when we're coming into a business, right? There's going to be there's going to be um, the the expectation that the that the doctor is not going to be not going to be taking chances that are going to result in having to spend a million dollars the way Dr. Horowitz did to defend his medical license. They're not going to be in a position where, you know, you're going to have to move to another state the way um way, the way some of the other doctors have where where um oh what the heck is his name? I can't remember right now. It's 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 escaping where he had to move to North yeah, Carolina yeah. to practice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sick. Yeah, Dr. Jemsek. Dr. Jemsek had to move to North Carolina, you know, and now he's back in back in DC, right? I mean, we you know, we have we have these issues all the time, right? Where people who are treating patients with tick-borne illness are are the subject of of of, of insurance company and or uh, you know medical boards. And then we then we also have the issue of of now having to treat children who have tick-borne illnesses, right? Well, I but I think. There are many things in general that when you treat children, you need to be more cautious. And I think we all are. And um, 
And it, it also is a matter of knowing your place, what makes sense for you and what doesn't. And I say that because there are some medicines, I don't give kids antibiotics. Yes, I was trained to do that. Yes, I, in my training, I treated strep throats and pneumonia and whatever. Well, that was around 40 years ago. And the meds have changed. The bugs have increased. And I can't say that I am on top of that stuff. And what I want to be able to do is be the expert in what I'm doing. I'm not the expert in that. So I think for me to go playing around with those meds, and it's not playing around because obviously I do a lot of reading and whatever I use, it's not my expertise. And also if the kid gets into trouble, what, your psychiatrist giving clarithromycin? Well, okay, that one I can get away with. They're giving vancomycin? Are you giving three antibiotics at once? Uh, and a child psychiatrist? How many other child psychiatrists do that? Well, it's a setup for trouble. So one is, I don't feel that that's my expertise. And, and two is, I'm cautious. I have to be aware of, you know, the limitations around me. But in a sense, it's not a limitation because when you treat these kids, you need a team. And you want people on your team in different areas of medicine that are hopefully on top of the game and know what they're doing. So like there's one immunologist I work with and it's great because, you know, you are dealing with problems or changes in the immune system. So for us to be able to discuss it and he can take the antibiotics, I'll take the psychiatric um, and they both overlap. It's wonderful. I can call him up and say, listen, this kid is herxing. Now, do we want to maintain having a patient or do we want to get rid of the bug and the patient? We, you know, it's too dangerous. The kid's getting more depressed and suicidal. Well, that he doesn't want that. I don't want that. So let's 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 fill out the rest of your background. So how did you get from going to medical school at Columbia, beginning, beginning doing some, some work, you know, as an academic, because you taught for many years, and then ultimately becoming a clinician in New Jersey. What are the, what are the steps that brought you there? And then how did you ultimately become uh, passionate about treating not just children, but children who are suffering from psychological and psychiatric disorders who are suffering from tick-borne illness? Well, I've always loved kids. I mean, since I was seven, I knew I was going to be a doctor, but it, it was easy. I was going to be in pediatrics or veterinary medicine. So uh, I did better on my, my, my medical boards than my veterinary boards. So there you have it. Uh, I could have gone either way. Also, my father didn't like the idea of going to Kansas from Brooklyn. So that's another story. Um. But, you know, it, it was when you see children, well, first of all, the kids I see, they're in pain. And the families are in pain. And you can't ignore it. Well, I guess you could, but, you know. Um, so that's the pressure on you to do something. But do something that makes sense, okay? And I, I was really trained in the scientific model of, you know, not just assuming, not jumping to conclusions, okay? And um, so, okay, so I was trained on that, then wind up being a bipolar expert. Um, and um, what happens is, like I said, I, I, I have kids that are very, very sick. And so you've always got to think, well, what am I missing? Or, you know, or what could it be? And I had followed the work of Susan Sweeto at the National Institute of Health. She was head of um, child psychopharmacology or something like that. And Sweeto had looked at um, kids who had had a strep throat and then went on to not have necessarily have rheumatic heart disease, which we know after a strep, some people get, you know, with heart problems with their valves. But she knows a lot of kids were getting psychiatric issues and obsessive compulsive disorder and tics. And if you go back and if you look at the literature from like the 1880s and 1890s around, 
um, you will see that there's reference to that. Sir William Osler, who's a famous uh, physician, wrote about how many of these individuals just showed a lot of these OCD traits, or they were very moody or labile or sound, impulsive, sounded somewhat mad. So I was following her work, and it was great because three weeks after I saw her first lecture, I diagnosed my first kid with pandas. You know, I saw a kid with OCD and figured, okay, she said, check your strep titers. What the heck? Well, they were high. And um, they're also, he had a lot of streps. And I said, wow, three weeks and I already got one? <laughs> you know, kind of surprising. So, so that, of course, you know, makes you think even more how much is out there that I don't realize. So, okay, I continue to treat these kids. And, um, and she's doing her work and I go to lectures. And I had one little boy who was hospitalized a few times in one year, okay? Um, and, you know, it, it, he just, he wasn't doing well. And it was interesting because he was seeing somebody else and the person said that he was around 11 or 12 and the parents were told by the doctor, listen, you know, I think maybe you need to wait a few years. I don't know that there's much more we can do here. Just wait until he's a teenager. When they came to me and told me that, I almost died. I said, are you kidding? You wait till he's a teenager? Do you know the trouble you're going to have? If you don't intervene now? Because once he's a teenager, you have less control. They're going to be, you know, stealing the car, uh, hanging out in the wrong places, smoking, whatever. So um, anyway, so he did well with me for a short while. And then he had problems again. And I knew he would wind up in residential treatment unless I came up with some miracle. Well, you know, I had recently attended one of Sweeto's lectures. I said, okay, let me get titers on him. For strep, mycoplasma pneumonia, which causes walking pneumonia, um, but can cause other things. And they always test for Lyme, but it's testing for Lyme um by quest or lab course so good luck it's a coin coin toss as we know um well and his mother said he never had a strep in his life well the normal strep titer is like going by the lab let's say 180 it's 200. he was 800. wait a minute he never had a strep in his life and his titer is 800. huh well something's off here so um, once I was sure that that was a real lab, uh, you know, finding, because, you know, sometimes the labs make mistakes, you know, so you need to repeat things. Um, I had him see a specialist who treated kids uh, with pandas and um, referred the child to him and he worked him up and um, treated him, but put him on an antibiotic and the kid didn't seem to change. I mean, the kid was just angry, irritable. I knew underneath he was a love, but he was just hard to be with. And, uh, you know, he'd fight John at everything. And yet he was a good boy. So um, he's on the antibiotics. Nothing changes. His behavior didn't change. And his titers didn't change, really. So the immunologist added another antibiotic to it. Yeah, one or two, and I think just one. And then I see this kid three months later and he walked into my office and it was the most amazing experience I ever had because I had this young man come in, um, sit next to his mother and kind of lean on her being affectionate as opposed to fighting her or any, whatever. And he said, you know, Dr. Greenberg, I think I'm gonna get all A's in school. That's what I wanna do. I'm really gonna work very hard. Well, he didn't do his homework before. What do you mean you're gonna do this? It was like, who was this person I was seeing in front of me? Now I've been in psychiatry a lot of years. And even at that point I had been in it. And I've never seen anything like that. I said, oh my God, 
there's something here that's just important and very different and wow. Okay, so I continue to test my kids for infections. Okay, now I noticed that more of them have evidence of mycoplasma infection uh, on blood tests than, um, on, than strep. Okay. Then somebody talks about how ticks carry mycoplasma. Huh. And you know, there are different types of mycoplasma. And I thought, well, maybe I'm getting positive because of cross reactions from other mycoplasmas. So I call up the head of the lab, and, and uh, this was a Mayo Clinic, you know, and uh, the person, and I said, look, could it be cross reactivity? And he said, yeah. Okay. Now, what do you do with this? Okay. So you start reading more about Lyme and ticks and discover that these tests, regular tests, are terrible. And that's when I entered the world of Lyme, and um, I never came back from that. <laughs> because I say the ticks went after me. I did not go after them. Okay? <laughs> so and that changed everything. So that what year was this? I'm sorry? <laughs> what year was this? Two thousand twelve, thirteen, something like that. So, so Debbie, what, what's your reaction to an Ivy League educated doctor who's had many years of practice and has to trip into this world of tick-borne triggers for um, psychiatric and psychological disorders for children? Couple thoughts. First off, thank God. Thank God you put the pieces together. And I know you're helping so many kids. And um, I know it's uh, your leading edge. You're like the first person to buy a Tesla or to buy an iPhone. You're like, or electric car, right? You're right there out in the forefront. And um, it's really a struggle, I think, for so many parents. Now, cause you know, there's, there's almost a word of mouth going on right, through social media, friends, family, and more and more people are becoming aware of it on the ground and the doctors are not. And it's such a huge challenge for us because there are so few doctors and there's even less psychiatrists. Like just, a, you know, a handful. If there's just a couple in the country, I, that would not surprise me. And, you know, I guess one, one question I have is what, what can happen to help bring in more psychiatrists and more doctors and bring awareness to the real possibility that there is an infectious cause to all these behaviors that we're, we're seeing with our children? Well, I'm a firm believer in education, education of the lay population, as well as physicians uh, and caregivers uh, in the mental health field or medical field. And, you know, it's Yogi Berra. If I didn't, uh, if I didn't believe it, I wouldn't see it. And so they have to be exposed to it. They have to know that that is a possibility. Okay, so education is key. Part of that is uh, writing articles in medical journals and in lay press, um, you know, cause I mean, my patients share articles with me. I share things with them. We learn from each other. I mean, I don't know everything. Uh, I wish I did, but it ain't working that way. So, um, and they, they, you know, show me about talks or different things. And it's really actually, it, it's kind of fun. Um, but it's education. So through articles in the medical literature, articles in the lay literature, um, podcasts, uh, getting on TV shows, um, just, and in medical school, introducing this as an issue. 
You know, medical education um, slowly is changing. I think people are beginning to recognize, first of all, one issue is there's a One Health movement that talks about One Health. Animals, living things, all of us really, we're related. And, um, and you know, the dogs get the same cancer as we do. And if you can help them, that actually can help us. So some schools are actually integrating a, a bit of um, veterinary, veterinarians in it in their program um, to help with training, which I think is like brilliant and about to me. Um, but the medical school issue, I think, is an important one. Look, I, I, I grew up in Brooklyn. Who knew about tickets? I mean, I just didn't. We didn't talk about it. It wasn't an issue. And even I've lived in New Jersey for 37 years. I really never thought about it that much. I'm not a hiker. Um, you know, I don't go camping. You know? Um, so it was my patients that taught me. And I feel it's, it's my um, mission to help others learn about this. Now, there are a lot of barriers to that. I mean, when I submit articles to psychiatric journals, the top ones, um, they're easily rejected. And that is true in a lot of the main medical literature. Because I am not a um, Ivy League institution, I'm just a poor clinician. What do I know? You know, that, that's a shame because clinicians bring a tremendous amount to the table in terms of, you know, the more you see something, the more you know it. But, but Dr. Greenberg, I think it's more than a shame. I think it's really dangerous. And I, and I think we need to talk about that in the context of what we talked about a moment ago, which is the difference between a, a researcher and a clinician, right? The, the clinicians are not going to be able to use anything other than safely within the confines of their license unless it's a generally accepted medical practice and how we define generally accepted medical practice is based on the literature that's available to those of you who are practicing in the field so if those of you who are on the front lines are not given the respect that the medical journals require to publish your work then we can't change the generally accepted medical practices so that your observations and your conclusions can be used by others. Well, look, I think there is a scientific method and I think we are all subject to um, in a in incorrect conclusions with observations, okay? If a mother comes to you, and says, my child is off. And my, there is something so different. And I think it's because of always oh, watching too much TV or whatever. And maybe. Know that nobody knows a kid like their mother. If their mother says there's a problem and a difference, there is. It may not be the way she put it together. Okay? It not may not be what she thinks it is. But nobody knows them like their mother. And if their mother says there's something wrong, there's something different, there's something. A mother knows, and and you know often, and especially with these tick-borne illnesses, they, they they get dismissed, like you know, oh look, it's just whatever. Look, I had I know one little guy. He's three. Well, he was three. He's now actually six. Anyway, um, he had seen like. But before he was four, he saw nine different medical specialists. And um, so what happened was he, he didn't sleep through the night since he was a baby. And finally, when he started talking, he said, mom, my back hurts, my legs hurt. She takes him to the pediatrician who says, growing pains. Animals don't usually get growing pains, okay? Um. Anyway, of course, eventually I found out the kid, I tested him, he had Lyme, he had Bartonella, he had Babesia, what a shock. But all I could think of was this poor baby didn't sleep probably because he had pains, it was congenital Lyme. 
and he probably couldn't sleep because he hurt. And and for to dismiss his symptoms, look, a lot of times it, it is very hard to diagnose. What are the typical symptoms that kids have of everything? They always get headaches. They always complain of stomach aches, maybe some GI upset. Um, get a kid who's overtired. They're nasty. They're impossible. They're hard to deal with. So, you know, a lot of these things are very similar to what you see with these infections. And then it's a matter of teasing out. Well, when is it something more than normal childhood stuff? Okay. You know, people come to me and they say, oh, well, you know, it's just normal teenage thing. And I always say, what's normal teenage thing? What are you talking about? Because many times it's not. Every kid isn't as nasty or whatever as what they're describing. Uh, I'm not, I'm really, I'm not putting down the pediatrician who did that with the three-year-old. But it breaks my heart as a mother and as a doctor to think this poor child was crying and couldn't well, see. Let's talk about that, Dr. Greenberg. You know, one, one of the things that we learned from uh, from our good friend, uh, Phyllis Bedford from the Limelight Foundation is uh, she actually refers to Lyme disease as the supermarket diagnostic disease. That in most cases, people are getting diagnosed with Lyme disease when they bump into a friend in the supermarket and someone's mother observed the same symptoms in their child, and then they end up getting referred to another doctor, right? So, um, you know, one of the one of the other things I sort of want to add to that is, and one of the reasons why Debbie it, Debbie Kimberg, my co-host today, is one of my favorite people, is because she shared with us very vulnerably about all the struggles she had as a mom trying to get her child uh, and her children the treatment that they needed, right? So the real heroes here. Uh, despite the Freudian model that your predecessors were trained with, which blamed mothers for everything, it's actually the real heroes here are the moms, right? Uh, moms or are dads. Heroes. Or well, dads. But I have to tell you, I have to tell you, Dr. Greenberg, that's not been my experience. Very rarely have I seen dads actively involved, at least in this podcast, with 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 um with supporting their children. Again, we can talk about that in a minute, but let's say about moms for a minute, right? Because one, one of the things that I, I want to observe here is that um, one of your colleagues from Columbia, uh, Dr. Fallon, uh, I, know you've, uh, I know you're familiar with his research because I've seen you quote him in your blogs. He, he, had, he had published a piece uh, several years ago, which indicated that the average child must see seven different doctors before getting a Lyme disease diagnosis, despite having very clear Lyme disease symptoms from the first visit. So if we need to see seven doctors, in part that's happening because despite people as smart and as educated as capable as, as Debbie Kimberg, she has to go from doctor to doctor to doctor to even get a diagnosis. So what's going on with the medical community and why aren't your colleagues listening to moms, even really gifted, intellectually gifted people like Debbie Kimberg? What's going on here? Well, okay. I mean, you can look at it from many different ways. Um, you could say, look, everybody reads Dr. Google, so they know everything. Okay, and that is what doctors are confronted with. Uh, you know, but it's that story in medical school. The medical student at the beginning reads about all these illnesses, all these illnesses, and discovers he must have all of them. And, you know, and that's not the case. So there is clearly clinical judgment involved. But, you know, tick-borne illness especially is something that has had a lot of confusion, um, misinformation. Um, and so I, I think it very much, uh, and a lot of emotional reaction to information. It's like my side or your side, which is crazy. We're talking medicine, organisms. And, um, so that makes it much harder for, um, so we'll go by, I will see a child that will go to a medical, and I'll, for example, one kid, he was positive with Babesia fish. Um, that's fluorescent in situ hybridization. With this test, you, you know, uh, Babesia goes in red cells, red red cells. So you, for it to be positive, you have to have three red blood cells that have the organism in it. Well, if you have eyes and can count, you would think, you know, positive is something that's positive. Anybody could see, really, okay? 
you know, you're not trying to figure out how dark the line is or anything. That three is three. And, you know, I've seen kids go to these places and the doctors look at this and say, I don't know what this test is and look it up. And they say, anyway, no, that's no good. That doesn't mean anything. And it's like, you gotta be kidding. So there's so much misunderstanding. Well, but there is, but there's there's also a failure to use your best diagnostic tools, right? We we, well, know we don't that. have good enough diagnostic tools. Well, no, That's but you part do. of our problem. But here, but here's the problem. Look, I agree with you that that the uh, and I read your brilliant blog on the two tier test, and I don't think anyone's done a better job of 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 taking apart the challenges with the two tier test, and you did it in your blog, so I, I appreciate that. But you have diagnostic uh, tools. Yes, the. The, the diagnostic tool, the two tier test sucks. We know it sucks, but you have Debbie Kimber, who you just a minute ago said, moms know their children better than anyone. You have Debbie as a diagnostic tool. She understands her children. She knows what their needs are. She knows what they're, she spends all, all day with them. That's a diagnostic tool, right? You often have patients who are coming in and giving you very specific details about what's going on with them, right? What's better than the onboard diagnostic system that each one of us has and the mom who can interpret that better than anyone else? But she, my point is she, she can misinterpret it. And there are a variety of factors that are going to affect how she reacts and what she sees. So we do need some objective or objective evidence, which I think is actually slowly happening. Um, the fact that the testing is not good enough, I think really hinders us because a lot of literature is dependent upon faulty testing. Okay, it's like this whole idea about what 70% get erythema migraine rash. Uh, maybe two of 100 of my patients had an erythema migraine rash. Less than a handful tested positive. Um, you know, uh, on, you know, not tested positive, but on they, the parents never even knew they had a bite. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Less than a handful. Parents didn't know the kids had a bite. So that's the real problem. So again, the old, if you don't believe it, you're not going to see it, but you need to, you know, if a kid's coming down with flu-like symptoms in the middle of the summer, well, COVID throws everything off a bit, but you know, you come on and think she may be exposed because flu-like symptoms are very much what you're going to get with a, with a tick bite and Lyme. Um, there is there's one sad case that was reported of a young man. He um, he went to I think a college course, but in the woods for a few weeks. Um, you know, around 17, 17 or 18, bright child is going to go to college at the end of the summer, came home and he was sick and he kept going to the doctor and the doctor kept saying, well, I don't see much of anything, you know, test him for Lyme. No, the stand test is negative. Um, a few weeks later, he tests him again. You know, the kid's getting sicker and he's not well. Well, anyway, within a month kids talking to his parent on the lawn, falls down and his heart stops. I mean, perhaps if somebody had Lyme on their radar, you wouldn't know because Lyme can cause significant cardiac dysfunction as well as death. And that's what happened to this poor boy. And so the newer tests came back, I think, after he had died, and they were positive. Sure. Terrific. So, so Debbie, give, give us your reaction to the way you were either respected or not respected as a mother when you were seeking uh, care for your children. Um, so one of the things that has struck me about the way people experience this illness is that it seems to me that people who are bit tend to be more likely to have more physical symptoms like 
muscle pain, arthritic pain, um, in those type weakness, muscle weakness in those type of issues. And we were coming from a congenital line experience where I didn't know I had it. I had super mild symptoms. Nobody would ever suspect it or test it in me. And they, you know, if somebody like yourself, Dr. Greenberg had seen me, you probably would have picked up on it just from even my mild non-traditional symptoms. I diagnosed symptoms. a lot of the mothers. I, I bet you do. We should definitely talk about that. Um, but, you know, as parents of these congenital kids, we go to psychiatrists and doctors for behavioral issues. Right. It's almost all behavioral. And we think of behavior as something different, right? It's my kid's not compliant. I'm not a good parent. I don't know how to deal with this. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems to fall in a different type of genre of issues versus wait, there's some medical condition. It's not bad parenting. Your mm -hmm. kid's not a terrible kid. And there's some there's something else that's causing all of these issues. And so for myself, I didn't know what I was looking for when I started to see doctors. I just it I just stumbled on a doctor who knew how to diagnose. Mm -hmm. And so that's so important because you either stumble on it or I love that analogy. It's a supermarket conversation and and that's how people find out about it. Um, and, and so I think that presents a whole different set of issues when we go to psychiatrists because we're coming in, right? We're talking about our kids who are struggling. They might be struggling in school, struggling with friends. They have OCD to varying degrees. They may have tics. And so we're looking to our doctors to guide us. And the first thing we get is, here, let me give you a prescription. So let's unpack, I think, I think this is raising a really powerful question, right? And uh, you know, one of the things that Dr. Ellen and McDonald argue to us is that we have a definitional problem. It's really a problem of definition. We do not have a definition for Lyme disease, right? And what kept running through my head as the two of you were just discussing this, this, this part of our conversation is, is our problem that we are defining both acute Lyme disease and chronic Lyme disease with the same definition? And is it also a problem that we're defining a, a, a variety of microbes being spit into or ultimately being, uh, being you know, contracted through congenital means as the same disease, right? And so Dr. McDonald said is we need a divorce from Lyme disease. We need a divorce from the term because is it acute? Is it chronic, right? Now let's, let's focus on that piece for a minute, right? So well, you know, there very rarely do we see patients going from an acute phase immediately to a chronic phase. And what we've been told by Dr. Phillips and Dr. Rawls, for example, in their clinical practices, other than when somebody was living in, for example, a toxic mold environment, or they suffered multiple tick bites at the same time, did they go from the acute phase to the chronic phase, right? There's generally some gap in between the two that essentially your, your, your body is managing the microbes for many, many years. And then there is some immune disrupting event that triggers the chronic illness, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the question that I have to ask the two of you is, do you believe that we are under diagnosing um, congenital Lyme disease or do we, do we believe because we are not seeing a connection, a temporal connection between the tick bite and the onset of chronic um, chronic symptoms that we're calling that chronic, we're calling that congenital when in fact it really is a tick bite that just di didn't result in chronic uh, symptomology until many years later. You know, that's, that's an excellent point. Forgive me because I have a dog who's whining next to me because he's <laughs> dying to go out and I'm trying to get someone in this household to do that and somehow I am ineffective at the moment. So my poor dog, honey, hold on another minute. So um, 
let's see. That is exactly what happened with syphilis. Okay, who would believe you get these lesions on your penis, your privates, whatever. And then uh, 30 years later, you get dementia? Come on. Can you imagine what it took? The autopsies and everything else it took because, um, you know, treponema pallidum, which causes the spirochete, which is like Lyme does the spirochete, the causes. Uh, uh, syphilis is very hard to culture. It was very, very hard to culture. And also, who's going to believe that, you know, look, those lesions went away. I'm fine. What are you talking about? So we repeat history in so many ways that it is frightening. If you really read about syphilis and the history of it and how long it took to finally accept it, do you know, once they understood syphilis um, in the 1920s, like, 30s, uh, they were able to discharge like one fifth of the people in psychiatric hospitals in the US. I mean, come on. And so that's a beautiful example. Except the spirochete of syphilis it has less DNA than the spirochete of Lyme. So it's in a perfect place to give you more trouble. And it's the same kind of thing. Testing is lousy. It's not easy. It hasn't been easy to culture. I mean, you have so many of the same issues. And it's great. You read these doctors' debates, you know, especially, wait a minute, you're having babies born with, uh, you know, brain lesions, uh, heart lesions, syphilis. I think on autopsy, they found like 56% of those who had syphilis had uh, heart issues. There are cardiovascular issues, at least. So, and yet we're surprised that Lyme is causing death or requiring heart transplants. I mean, uh, if you get a child with um, abnormal uh, EKGs, uh, and I always get EKGs on my kids. You gotta think Lyme is a possible cause of a block. Um, and especially if you're gonna give them medicines. Um, I, I think sometimes I'm, I may be more cautious than many of my colleagues, but that's because of my training. I told you I read more EKGs during my psychiatry training than my medical training. So, as, as you should have, right? Because if, 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 if these diseases are in fact, if these neurological disease and the psychiatric and psychological diseases are in fact biologically based, then you should be studying the diagnostic tools and learning how to use the diagnostic tools that will allow you to make the connection between some, and, and let's talk about the, 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 the Horowitz three eyes, uh, three eyes. Dr. Horowitz always says chronic Lyme disease is infection, inflammation and immune dysfunction. You agree and with that or disagree with that? I, 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 think, um, I think it's very bright, but um, he left some out. Okay. So I, call, I call it the five eyes. Okay, and so I swear I did not hear his stuff when I came up with that. Okay, so give me, give me the other two eyes. What is Horowitz missing? Inheritance, your genes. Okay. Crucial. Your inheritance determines so much about what you're going to be vulnerable to or not, as well as all about, um, you know, uh, epigenetics and all of that stuff. But we link that in inheritance, okay? Okay. You inherit, uh, so you have inheritance and then you have an insult. I'm sorry, an insult? An insult. An insult means some environmental thing that causes change. That can be infection. That can be uh, a toxin. That can be trauma to the head. Okay, but you have some form of insult that then changes 
what you started with and changes those genes. Well, the body's reaction to any form of insult is inflammation. And of course we know that's the buzzword in everything, in heart disease, in mood issues, in everything under the sun. Everybody's talking about the role inflammation plays in all these disorders, mental and physical. And then you have immune dysfunction because that's when, you know, okay, you start your body's initial response is, you know, this uh, immune reaction, but then it's, oh, what happens with, you know, your, um, your cytokines, your immunoglobulins, your blah, 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 okay? That then results in the last die which is illness. In my case, my patients, it's psychiatric illness, but it can just as well be physical illness. Okay, I, I, I see that and each arrow goes back and forth because each one modifies the other so that you're getting genes turned on and turned off. You may be getting recurrent or non-stop uh, inflammatory response or immune response. All of these are what's resulting in that final illness. And that's really how I see it. And to me, I find that that's great because it provides you with different areas of intervention. Okay, you can't change your inheritance much. You know, I mean, your genes are <laughs> Although there is some turning on and turning off, but we're not good at that yet. Okay, but um, environments. Uh, well, it's important. Look, if you live in a house that's full of mold, you know, and, and you have any immune issue, you're set up for problems. And one fact that people don't realize, you know how we're all talking about mold now, and I know we, when I grew up with the dinosaurs, we never talked about mold. Now we never talked about a lot of things. But um, in 1978, the government passed a law where there was no more lead. Lead was no longer allowed to be in paint. Lead is a mold retardant. Once they did that, they were allowed to sell whatever remaining cans they had, but could not put lead in the paint. And since everything used to have lead that's loaded, but now doesn't, and there's not a good retardant, you know, that's, that's cost effective and not toxic in its own way. That's probably an important component to why there's a lot more mold problems. So, uh, you know, everything is affected in so many different ways. And especially, like I said, environmentally, you know, there's a lot we can do. Um, and then there's our next business idea, right? Let's develop a whole set of paints that are eco-friendly and mold yeah, retardant. If you could <laughs> at a, at a, at a uh, decent price, I'm telling you, you could do well. If you want to use that <laughs> your business model, go ahead and I'll. And if you do the it, I'll go, go, okay. Hey, look, you know, we could all use uh, another. Uh, Source of income, what the heck? But no, but that, but that's like, who would have thought? We were protecting our kids because everybody remembers being upset about these poor children, you know, ingesting, eating their windowsills and coming down with lead poisoning. Right. It caused ADHD, it caused brain damage. So here we are, we're gonna save everybody. Well, it caused some other problem. So let's talk about let's talk about risk and how we define risk because we're we're uh, we need a definition for risk as well because we 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 see Lyme disease cases going through the roof right and uh -huh. um and if you use uh, Stanley McChrystal's definition of risk which is which he used in his book risk he said it's a formula it's threat times vulnerability equals risk so let's talk about the threat piece of this and the vulnerability piece of this and why each one of them may be increasing the likelihood of us getting Lyme disease and our children getting Lyme disease, right? So on the vulnerability piece, um, we, we, we have a number of different factors in our lives that are causing us to have 
weaker immune systems, right? You gave us some examples, Dr. Greenberg, of these environmental events, these physically physical traumatic events. We have social media. We have all kinds of different um, immunosuppressive uh, suppressive, um, events that we didn't have when we were young, because I'm one of the old guys too. So talk to us about what you're now seeing in your practice from the standpoint of the vulnerability that children have today that perhaps they didn't have in the past because of the changes in the world that they're living in. Look, uh, I started practicing over 40 years ago. And the kids today are sicker. They have grown sicker. I've seen this. Okay, when I started practicing, perhaps one in 10,000 had autism. Now, what is it? One in 56, 54, New Jersey, like one in 36. I mean, come on. Clearly something and many things are very different. And I think, I think we know that. Um, so, you know, things have definitely changed. We just have more uh, food is all processed. We're spraying it with God knows what. It's all over. It's what we take in. It's where we hang out. Aside from the fact that we know that the climate change is affecting ticks um, and they are spreading more. That's on the threat piece, right? I mean, the threat is increasing because there are more ticks and we're coming in contact with more ticks. And, and, and more are infected. More are showing multiple infections. Okay, you know, it used to be a lot less if you took it on Long Island, if you look at the ticks compared to what infections they may carry now. Lucky us. So, um, you know, we have that. Also, you know, we're beginning to, there are so many things that are infecting us that we don't know. And I mean like infections. There's one Bartonella that's known as, uh, often thought of as a, a co-infection. Um, people argue whether it's carried by ticks or not. Um, and, and that's a different issue. Um, but you know, it's carried by fleas and flies. The way Bartonella became known is because of AIDS patients. They started having all these vascular and ugly lesions um, because they were immunosuppressed. And so uh, this then suddenly became studied. And uh, I think they actually visualized the organism in 1990, 1992, for the first time. Well, any parent who's had a kid who's had Bartonella will tell you, rage is not an uncommon symptom. They are often angry, irritable, and out of control. You know, and then the people say, well, how could this be? How, how could this be, this, this infection is really making him that way? Well, there are other infections. For example, Toxoplasma gondii. That is a parasite. Uh, you can get it from meat that's not cooked well enough. It causes cat scratch disease, okay? So you can get it from your cat. That's why pregnant women just stay away from cleaning cat litter and things like that. Well, toxoplasma, what it does, if a mat, the only place a, um, the organism can reproduce is the cat gut, okay? So its goal is to get into the cat. Now, um, mice that are infected with toxoplasma, they lose their fear. They go towards the mouse, not away from the mouse. So that is a change in behavior that the parasite is causing in the mouse. So why do we think, well, why don't we realize they're causing changes in us too? And if you look at uh, studies with Toxo in adults, these people can have more car accidents. It's been associated with bipolar disorder. So people who are more risk-taking, 
um, and also more bossy and whatever. I mean, there are a whole bunch of things. Well, why do we think we're different than that little mouse and cat? I, I think we need to recognize these bugs are doing things to us. And, uh, and we need to understand it to figure out how to deal with that, how to control it and not let it control us. But that's why sometimes you're going to, just as you're going to see a dramatic personality change sometimes with a stroke. Well, these bugs can affect your vasculature and you can get a stroke from that. And that's going to affect it depending on the region. So it is all so much more complicated, but to not recognize the importance of infection in psychiatric illness me is missing the point. I'm not saying it's responsible for all psychiatric illness. I don't believe that. I can't explain it all. I'm not that smart, but it is responsible for an important amount. And I do believe that in children, the presenting symptom of tick-borne illness line with psychiatric symptoms most commonly, other than headache. Headache is the most frequent. The next one, psychiatric symptoms. And maybe I'm wrong. That's fine. Somebody, please do some studies and test this out. I'll be thrilled. Well, but let, let's talk about some of the clinical observations you've made, right? Because you've done chart studies on at least two occasions, because I read that in your blog. Huh? And, in, in, and in the chart studies that you've done on two separate occasions, um, you found that over 70% of your patients who had um, psychiatric disorders had Lyme disease. Yeah. Or, or some other tick-borne illness. Maybe that wasn't picked up and it could have been Babesia or Bartonella, maybe, you know, maybe they had some combination of the above. Well, but okay, that is true. And I did find that. And quite honestly, the first thing I did was look at my bipolar kids and uh, I found it through them. As I got into Pans and Pandas, I started, you know, getting the testing on my newer kids that were um, most of them, of course, are bipolar. That's why they're sent to me. So I kept getting that and I said, wait a minute, what about these kids I've been treating for 10 years? What about them? I've never tested them for any of this stuff. Well, if I'm doing with my newer patients and finding things, I should look back at my older patients. Surprise, surprise. Majority had tick borne illness also. You know, I, I mean, when I was first asked to present some of these results, I didn't, I, I, I was very uncomfortable. I said to my girlfriend, how can I do this? You know, it just doesn't make sense. Everybody and his mother has, you know, tick-borne illness. But okay, the reality is I work in a Lyme endemic. Okay, New Jersey, tons of ticks all over the place. And so what I saw I can't say is true in other places. What I can say was true in my practice, where there is in an endemic area. That's true, at least you know for me. So, so you're what you're seeing is just about every one of your patients has some form of a tick-borne illness, and or at infection. some more infection. Okay. It could be pandas. Okay, it could be a strep. Well, okay. Well, but so let, let's talk about that, right? Because, you know, we, 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 we sort of, we're bouncing around this definition of Lyme disease, right? And, and I think at least the, the, the definition we've accepted here at Tick Boot Camp is that it's a polymicrobial infection causing multi-system, uh, multi-system infection, right? Polycrobial, poly- And we're going to change it from being Borrelia. When, once you say, see, this is part of the issue and you're absolutely right. Yeah. The verbiage, what do we say? When you say Lyme, I think of only of Borrelia. Well, so when you say Lyme's okay, right? No, no, but but because because it really is a disease without a definition, we don't have a definition. And if you don't have a definition, how are we going to treat it? How are we going to diagnose it? What are we going to do? Well, first off, I, I think we have to figure out what to call it because I think we're all saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. Lyme itself doesn't make sense because. That specifically means one infection, right? Borrelia, mm -hmm. and everything gets left out. And so even if a doctor thinks, oh, I'm going to test for Lyme, 
he's testing for Borrelia and does or she and doesn't always realize all the other infections Absolutely. that they need to test for. And along with that, I think we get bound by the term Lyme or even tick, right? Because we're seeing so much prevalence of something like Bartonella, which I is really a pet peeve of mine, both of these things actually. But you know, research is being published that's focused on ticks and they can't mention Bartonella yet in the LymeDisease.org study, a third of people have Bartonella along with the Borrelia. And so how do we leave it out of the discussion? It is damaging information for doctors and it's really damaging patients because we know, especially ones who know Bartonella is causing most of the symptoms and it, it's just making that conversation so much harder. Well, you think most doctors have not heard of Bartonella, Babesia? And what exactly. else? I mean, really, look, I had one little guy, uh, I remember it was New Year, uh, and he winds up getting um, sick, I guess he had a fever, whatever, but he also had some behavioral things, um, gets hospitalized locally, and, you know, they're not sure exactly what's going on with him, they give him two doses of an antibiotic, and then decide, the, even though he's getting better, the antibiotic's doing nothing, so they just stop it, send him home, and I call the parents in a week, he'll be sick again once the antibiotics out of his system because I had tested him and his brother uh, for tick-borne illness and his uh, Bartonella titers were high. Okay, so what happens? A week later, he gets re-hospitalized. He gets a spinal tap these ta this time because of all his different symptoms and problems. They don't find anything there. They give him, they throw antibiotics at him and uh, he looks better, they send him home and say, you know, you should go to an expert over at NYU. I, I tell them about the Bartonella. Everybody ignores me. That's nice. Thank you. He then winds up in another, a major teaching hospital in the city. And um, because of recurrence of symptoms, he even winds up with another spinal tap. Um, the bottom of his feet hurts. I mean, just things that make you think Bartonella. Dreams Bartonella. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's Bartonella. You know, it's so funny. At least in the supermarket, it would. Well, <laughs> well, that's just it. He came and saw me between the hospitalizations, and he's walking in my hallway. And I look out, I said, what's going on with you? <laughs> I said, my feet hurt. You know, Bartonella. There was no question. Anyway. So after they really couldn't figure out what was wrong with him in the second teaching hospital, but he looked a little better because of course they had given him some antibiotics to try to make things better, even though they weren't exactly sure what it was. Um, I, I then sent him to one of my colleagues who treated him. Of course, the kid three weeks later, you know, was healthy and stayed healthy. Um, you know, if it's not on your radar, you're not gonna think about it. If you've never been taught about it, Bartonella, you know, if you look at Bartonella, Bartonella causes cat scratch disease. If you read about cat scratch disease, often it's said to be a self-limited illness, okay? Which means it'll go away on its own and you don't have to do much of anything. Although there are cases of it causing a vasculitis, an encephalitis, and some other, th and, and blood issues. You know, I think there's so much more there than we have been able to appreciate. It's like these studies, I can't comment about what I think of them, but you can tell probably from the way I refer to them, about erythema migrans. Somebody has the rash, you treat them with an antibiotic for two weeks or a week and it goes away. And you follow up three months later and it hasn't recurred. You've, you've made them better. What are you talking about? That's not good science. And yet this is what's published. This one just got published recently. This this week, yeah. And, and actually the, the, the study that was published uh, this past week suggested that seven days of antibiotic treatment- That's right, that's the one. 14, 14 days. And we all know you need at least six weeks because the, the life of I, I, Borrelia right, is going to be four weeks. So we- I believe this. 
I just, and that gets published. And so some people are going to do that. I mean, I just, I am amazed when I see this. There's not, what kind of thinking is going on? The rash will go away on itself if you just leave it alone. Right. Right. And, and, but, you know, again, part of that problem, Dr. Greenberg, is it, is it we're, we're defining the acute disease and the chronic disease the same way. I mean, well, it, it's true. really a problem with definition, right? And, but let, let's get to where this is sort of taking us because what's really happening with somebody who becomes chronically ill, whether they be a child or an adult, isn't it really, and again, I'll use, I'll use another one of Dr. Rawls's metaphors, the pot boiling over. It's not just what the tickets spit into you. It, it's not just, you know, one or two or three or however many microbes it's been into you. It's also all the microbes that your body has been harboring for whatever period of time it's been harboring well, and it's been, and, and then ultimately the immune dysfunction and all that's coming together at the same time and you become clinically ill, right? I mean, well, and Ill. that's just it. You see, um, you only see what you know. So when people look at these kids, and let's say they'll get a whole battery of testing, but you don't know about like how bad uh, LabCorp and Quest is on Lyme. You'll see, oh, the Epstein Barr is positive, and the herpes right. is positive, and these are viral things. Ah, oh, that must be what's going on. Well, this is really you got to hit it at the top, and at the top of the tick-borne illness, because what those things are are really evidence that your immune barrier is breaking. And so things that your body kept under control are now coming through. So it's not you go address the viruses, go address what's causing it, the tick-borne illness, the bacteria, the protozoa, whatever. And then those other things will go back down. Not everybody, but most of the time, yes. So um, are, are you questioning Dr. Sweeto's work in that folks had a strep infection and then saw these, you know, very different behaviors right after OCD and right. anorexia and hallucinations and so on. Are you questioning maybe something else is also going on that there's underlying tick-borne infections that got Not activated everybody. by the I don't, I don't, You know, that's just it. That's like I said, how I got into this. Okay. With that some people think it may be the first strep infection that sensitizes you. I don't know. Um, but I don't think all of the kids that Sweeto looked at had tick-borne disorders too. I do think probably many of those that were hard to treat, um, that kept on having symptoms may well have had some tick-borne disorders that were unrecognized. And I think mycoplasma, to me, if I see a kid with high mycoplasma titers, even a high IgG, which is a former infection, I always say, okay, I'll bet your money there's a tick-borne illness there. And usually there is. So, Can I, you know? So, so Dr. Greenberg, so what do, you, what do we, how do we help people to determine how to work and partner with their doctors to treat these illnesses, right? Because it's it's really, it's a mixed bag, right? It, it's gonna be different for every single person in part because of a lot of the factors you talked about with your five eyes, but in part because depending on how many different ticks you've been bitten by, it, you know, you could have a whole bunch of combination of, of, of things spit into you. Absolutely. And then of course you could have whatever other bugs you've picked up during the course of your life, whether it be strep or it be, you know, EBV or what, you know, whatever it happens to be, when you put that whole sort of mix of microbes there, how do we come up with a standard of treatment other than treating the soil and, and looking at things like nutrition, uh, or I should say diet and, and sleep and, and exercise and movement. And of course, aiding the body by reducing the microbe load with different forms of, of, of intervention, whether they be herbs or, mm -hmm. or, or antibiotics. I mean, how, how else can we do it other than treating the soil? Because it just seems to me that there's so many different permutations, it's impossible to do it any other way. Well, we could say we'll treat the soil, the water and the air and, and, and make everything better, but God, I don't think we're that good. 
Um, so Unless, like, well, I mean, I mean the soil of the body, right? The, 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 your, 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 your body, right? But the body is a complex system. Okay. We have, it has so many different types of systems and interactions. I mean, each thing, you know, your immune system, my God, the components, it's fascinating because you could see there are so many places where things could go wrong. It's amazing that it doesn't, okay? And that's true of every system in the body. Now, look, to some degree, I think we have to, first of all, you have to, people have to learn how to listen, okay? And listen to the history. You know, when I was in medical school, I was taught that, you know, over 90% of your diagnosis is in your history. Well, to me, that's still true psychiatrically. If you really get a good detailed history, it is amazing. And with the congenital issue, um, how did I wind up diagnosing so many moms? And, and really, with congenital Lyme? Because I go through the story with the daughter, and, and but in the history with the mother, I say, gee, you know, when you were like a teenager in your 20s, do you ever have times when like you had like mono, but it, like it came back or, or, or people thought you had MS or all these other things and, and then they worked you up and then no, you were better and you didn't have it, but nobody really understood. They said, oh, you know, maybe it was lupus, but we don't know or whatever. And I can't tell you how many times I find out that yes, there was some kind of history of some kind of like mystery illness earlier in their life. Um, so, so it, let's let's pivot over, Dr. Greenberg, to another another part of the risk assessment. We've spent a lot of time building out this vulnerability piece, and and it is pretty scary. But there's another part of this risk which I think is causing the um, you know the exponential growth curve of Lyme disease. And that is the threat. We talked a little bit. We talked a little bit about ticks and the increase in the number of ticks, the likelihood that we're going to come in contact with ticks, mm -hmm. and the microbes that the tick is carrying. But there are other ways we can get Lyme disease, right? We we touched on, and we we, we call this the 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 um, the threat square here at at uh, at Tick Boot Camp, right? We have we have ticks, we have congenital. Um, mm -hmm. We have blood. People can get get uh, Lyme disease through blood transfusions, and then we have sexual transmissions, right? So mm -hmm. we have these. We have the square, right? And the more people that have Lyme disease, and again, uh, we'll talk about Debbie, for example. Debbie had Lyme. Yeah. She passed it on to her children, right? Mm -hmm. Possibly pass it on to 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 her husband, right? They then get to pass it on to all the other sexual partners they have, and the children that they have, and 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 the curve keeps going up, right? Then of course we're good people, and we're asked to get blood, so we go and get blood, and when we get blood, transfusions are going to other people, and now they're getting, and 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 the this curve is is frighteningly exponential when you're looking at all the different ways that you can get um, you can get Lyme disease. So Debbie, I'm going to ask you as a mom first react to our our um Lyme disease threat square with the four different prongs and whether or not you believe that, that is what's causing Lyme disease to become um a an exponentially greater threat to uh to the world population such a good question um yeah I mean I kind of I kind of look at COVID and, and what happened there right because every time you see the curve spike right it it's bouncing kind of low on the curve and and it hits an inflection point eventually and and then you start really seeing it spike up and i think this could what's going on with tick-borne illness could be working in the same kind of way where you know it was low for a long time right you know maybe this tick over here had one infection this tick over here had another infection right it was it's very slow moving as far as transmission but over decades and to your point there's so many ways that it can be transmitted right these ticks are sucking off the same animals and so one tick infects 
the animal, a deer, what have you, a dog, a cat, another tick or flea or what have you can pick it up and they're transmitting it to us. And we humans have multiple ways to transmit right through uh, sexual activity, through, uh, through birth and through blood transfusions. There's, I, I think that's why we're seeing such a big uptick in cases. And my belief is that we don't even understand how big it really is oh, because I think there's so many people like myself who nobody ever thinks to test because, you know, so I have a little anxiety and I have a thyroid problem and I take Synthroid, life is good. You know, so what if my kids have ADHD or depression or autism, you know, that's different. And, um, and I think if you take the same idea and look at the autism curve, it's the same kind of curve, but it's elongated. And my hypothesis is that it's elongated because of the time it takes for, the, for a mother to give birth, you know, so somebody get, maybe gets infected when they're young, and 25, 30 years later, they start having kids and you start seeing that over generations. And I think that's why maybe the curve was flat for so long. If you, if you look at it, you can look at taka.org or some other um, sources and it's flat for a long time, but now in the past 10, 15, 20 years, it's really skyrocketing. I, I think there's going to be some correlations and possibly some causation there. I, I'd love to get your thoughts on that, Dr. Greenberg. Well, you know, look, uh, a recent study in the past year or two showed that um, one in seven people in the world uh, are serologically blood positive for exposure to Borrelia. Okay, the bacteria that causes Lyme. Well, that that's very interesting, to say the least. But that does mean that they all have Lyme. Okay, again, it will go into what are the factors that help bring it out. But obviously, it's latently in there. And you just have to wonder how much of an effect it has. Um, and you know, what this whole issue with infections, it appears that in poorer countries, and it's not just the economics, they have many more infections. And there are often lower IQs that go along with having more infections in that population you know you're sitting in the soil and the kids are putting their fingers in the mouth and the dog is and the chickens are making and whatever um so i think there are a bunch of factors though now that are causing a release in a lot of what's in us you know and we've been exposed to and that's i think part of what we need to really look at and understand but you know, I, I think as humans, sometimes we're very simple or, or want the world to be simple. So we think it's going to be one thing and that's it. And, you know, wish that that were so, but it just isn't. Um, and, and so, but that's why you need people working, scientists working together and across different fields and across different areas of, of treatment of medicine. I think there's so much that we can get from the veterinarians. And I think, you know, it's very interesting. They had this thing last week, they were talking on TV about, um, you know, I remember they, they used to take dogs and give them cancers or try, or try to, I mean, you do it often with mice or whatever, but you try to create the illness within the animal. And now they realize, you know, certain breeds are more likely to get certain cancers. So why don't we just look at the guys who have it and work from there? Because they are much more a realistic model of what the people are. It's not, you know, um, induced by however. It's they got it. 
and it's going to kill them. And what is it that we can do? And, you know, ethically, that makes a lot more sense. Okay. We're, we're not uh, doing away with animals um, when they were healthy. And we're also trying to help them as well as trying to help us. Um, very smart research. How important do you think it is for the CDC to take the rain to be able to really make progress? Or do you think somehow this could be a grassroots effort? Um, I think grassroots can push. Uh, I think it would be nice if the CDC would get more supportive and more on board with really what a lot of uh, us have found and, and are finding. I mean, look, we're treating my kids, and that's what I call them, my kids, my guys, okay? They get treated by one person. And then often they plateau. And because they plateau for a while, it's time to go see somebody else who has another piece of this puzzle. And that is a shame. And it's no fault of the first person they were seeing, but it's because of this lack of any good studies. Okay. That we don't know what really works or what really works in the kid who presents looking like he's bipolar or, or the kid, you know, we know more about the kids who have the knee problems than any psychiatric issues from these tick-borne illnesses. And there's also a lot of, I think, public misunderstanding about psychiatric treatment. Um, you know, the goal is not to make somebody a long-term patient, really. The goal is to help them be able to have a life. And when you come to tick-borne illness, you know, many times I'll diagnose the kid and say, look, I, you know, I think he's probably got Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella, and that's what's going on. And we need to get him treated by somebody who does that and believes in us. Um, but we need to get him assessed by that person because as a psychiatrist, I'm not supposed to really diagnose Lyme. But that's okay because I send them to somebody who's going to give them the right treatment and, and you know, that is fine. Um, but I lost my train of thought for the first time, guys. See, I told you I love to talk. Um, and we love you talking. <laughs> well, no, because this stuff is so so important oh but i know what i was saying i was talking about how there will be kids and so i will see them and i'll say look i think that's what he's really got and you need to see doctor so and so or whatever who's very familiar with this and in the meantime i think you know he's raging he's out of control i really think i need to give him something and i'll say no, you know what? We rather stay away from psychiatric medicines. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg. No, now that we know it's an infection, we're just going to go get that treated. And I explained to them that's up to them. But a few things. One is the kid right now is beating up the family as well as himself. You can't let that continue. You don't know how long it's going to take to treat the infections. And this poor child's self-esteem is going down the toilet. No friends like him because who would like this loud mouth, irritable, wants everything to be his own way. And so they're going to remember that at school for many years. So we need to protect that child. And many times psychiatric treatment can help as well as help with a depression. Um, it's, it's more a matter of <coughs> knowing how you do it, going slow, low doses and see how they are. Cause these kids are, you breathe on them the wrong way they act up. I mean, but, they're, I they're right, like, but I think you've identified the problem, right? One of the things we see in this community is that there has been a great deal of mistrust developed with, uh, pharmaceuticals. 
And the reason they distrust pharmaceuticals is because in most cases, what happens with the pharmaceutical is a doctor will give that to you and it, and, and it just resolves the symptomology without getting to the root cause. So people in most cases are taking the position, hey, I'd rather suffer through the symptoms so I have the signal and we can continue to get to the root cause. And, and, and because we don't have enough enlightened practitioners like you who are saying, okay, we're gonna use the pharmaceuticals so that they are a Band-Aid so that we can keep your family healthy and safe and physically uh, physically safe. And then as we're working through the root causes, we'll remove the pharmaceutical. Maybe, we'll get, maybe not. Or maybe, maybe not, right? But, but okay, see what, I think that's very important. Okay. I see that as part of the actual treatment. Okay. You know, I mean, I just saw a kid the other day and, and I know they had been to two different practitioners and they're treating with integrative stuff and, and the antibiotics and whatever. And what struck me is this kid's got a real depression. Why isn't anybody doing something for that? I mean, you know, this kid's going to get depressed enough that the kid's going to be suicidal. Well, and, you know, Fallon study showed yeah, that there's yeah, an yeah. association of Lyme and depression. And if you look at the study, actually, there are, there are some very scary statistics in there if you look at what it says the group between zero if you have um lime uh before the age of 10 those kids with the highest risk for having suicidal attempts as they're older or at least suicidal ideation okay having lime before age 10 is associated with suicidal thoughts and possible reactions that's crazy and the 10 to 14 year old group actually had significant mood effects. And as a group, probably more than the other age groups they have. People pay attention here. Um, and look, you see, people don't realize if you get sick as an adult, well, first of all, it's easier to see because you'll have a change in functioning. You know, you had a good job. Maybe you were a decent father and a decent spouse, and suddenly you change. Oh well, my God, everybody's going to notice it at some point. If you're a little kid and you're three or four and you suddenly become pissy and obnoxious, well, the terrible twos never went away, or that's really just who he is and he's just growing into himself. Or I know everybody thinks that kid was a genius and maybe he, he, he was smart, but look, this. You know, maybe for a two-year-old, he's smart, but this is, you know, this is who he is. Um, it changes the whole life trajectory. Okay. Um, and you see this, I mean, there are a certain percentage of kids who are diagnosed as autistic that probably have tick-borne illness. Oh, your doggie's coming in too, Rich. Um, <laughs> okay. And there's a certain percentage of kids. Um, Look, it's going to change them. And we need to know that it's going to affect them socially, emotionally, and developmentally. Kids, one study in New Jersey looked at kids with tick-borne illness and found that they missed so much school and had a lot of tutoring. And other studies have shown the drop in grades. And also, like I said, cognitively, you may have thought the kid was a genius and suddenly, you know, you ain't that swift. Well, you know, as parents, maybe that was your own craziness, but it could have been tick-borne illness. And maybe now he's having certain types of cognitive symptoms that very much go along with tick-borne illness. Um, you know, neuropsychiatric Lyme or probably the Barton and then Babesia. I mean, we haven't got the studies to show it, but these kids then have problems, first of all, one with processing speed. If they get specialized testing, specialized neuropsych testing, you're gonna see they have problems with processing speed. Well, processing speed is how the information comes in, how fast or slow, and they get it and how much it comes out. Now, if you're normal and fine, and then you start getting tick-borne illness and affecting you in that way, slowing your processing speed, you're gonna sit in the classroom, you'll be paying attention to the teacher, but by the time you're going in and out, she's on to the next thing. You're very much gonna look like you have an ADD. 
Okay. So, or, or a lower IQ, right? Really, isn't isn't IQ the speed at which you process data? So it's, your it's IQ a is a combination of different data. factors. But but if you don't learn, yes, it's going to affect your IQ. Yeah. I mean, I, but also you'll have kids, and I've seen kids with, I mean, their IQs are so high, but they struggle, and they struggle because of the processing issue. The other issue that often I see is problems with working memory. Working memory is like the SATs. You read something, you hold the paragraph in your head, and then you go to the questions and you go back here for the answers. Except if you have problems with working memory, there's nothing there. So you got to go back and you got to read it again. And you can see where that's going to affect learning and grades and everything else that we look at in an academic setting. So many times with these kids, it's helpful if you can look at, um, let's say, child study team testing over the years and see what areas may have been affected. Uh, and sometimes you can see, gee, you've got a kid who's like got 130 IQ, but his working memory is 5%. <laughs> I mean, these things are, are crucial to how you're going to do, what you're going to do with your life. You're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, or anything else it affects your education long-term education it affects your long-term ability to earn it affects your whole damn life and how you view yourself am i a fake am i a failure because everybody says i'm so smart but i don't i don't feel like it i can't I, this stuff is very hard for me could we go back and talk about something you touched on just a few minutes ago about these children, teens who are having excessive behavioral issues, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them are getting hospitalized either because of aggression, psychosis, um, <laughs> debilitating OCD. And mm -hmm. I, I actually spend a lot of time in the Facebook groups and, you know, it used to be for my own education and asking questions and now i i try and help other people mm -hmm. also sure. as an advocate but you know people are really struggling and mm -hmm. then you couple that with the you know they've got these sick kids and you go to the hospitals they don't know what you're talking about there's no psychiatrists available who understand what's going on and actually the first thing they probably want to do is take the kids off the antibiotics or whatever they're on because right there's medical kidnapping and what are you doing and maybe you're making your child sick but look we could leave that aside for a moment but mm -hmm. one of the questions probably one of the most asked questions for folks in that situation is how do i how do i bring my child back down it you know so that they can live a reasonable life at home while while we're going through treatment do you have any advice for them as far as how to work with psychiatrists and how to manage those medications and where to focus well look there are probably three groups of kids okay one um they initially need the psychiatric meds because they're wacky they're out of control they're doing dangerous things or they're psychotic or whatever you treat them for their tick-borne illnesses and once they are fully treated they don't need psychiatric meds personally i think that's a small group i really do then there's another group you treat them with the psychiatric meds and because remember we have biologic predispositions and once your buttons are pressed your buttons are pressed okay then you have the second group where they will need the psychiatric medicines and you treat them and over time they'll need less of the psychiatric medicine you it, it's funny i mean i see some of the kids suddenly like they did develop the side effects of the medicine that they never had before um like it's too much for them and it's making them too tired now and knocking them out or suddenly a kid's getting really nauseated uh, on the same dose he's been on for, you know, a long time. But his body's changing and his meds are changing. And that's also very important because the antibiotics do affect medication levels. 
And so the psychiatrist has to follow that and see which one's upping the antipsychotic, which one's lowering the antipsychotic and what you have to do. That's why, again, it's important to be working uh, with whoever's treating the kid. Also, in um, looking at the kids, especially these kids with tick-borne disorders, you know, when they herx, they're going to herx in the way in which they manifest their symptoms. So a hot knee is going to be a killer of a knee, while a hot temper is going to be off the wall. And in a sense, it's very important to prepare the parent for that. And my feeling is to be watching that child very closely during that time, because there are often times where I've had to call the person who's uh, prescribing the antibiotics and say, hey, listen, you know, it's too much for him. He's going to wind up in a psychiatric hospital if we keep this up. You got to back down. We'll have to figure out some other way to do this or whatever. Um, of course, often I can tell what's going on with them. Their psychiatric symptoms will tell me what's actually happening in their body and how they're doing. Is there any classes of medications that tend to work better for this population? Or is there any research available to maybe help guide the doctors on no. which are better? No, I would say you approach them um, as if um, they can have any reaction. And so you have to start low um, because it's easy, you know, if you use the, and I don't use the antidepressants. I treat them very much as if they're like my bipolar kids. And bipolar kids, if you give antidepressants, you can make them much more angry, agitated, manic, and out of control. So one needs to be careful. You know, you want to treat that OCD and the best thing for OCD maybe an SSRI, but you also may have somebody climbing out the window or having a mood, which is a mixed state, which is the up and down at the same point. They're full of energy, but they're miserable and hate themselves. That's a great setup for self-destruction. Um, so I, I think it's really something one has to do very carefully. Um, and, and parents are afraid of psychiatric medications and, uh, many times. And I'm very honest. I tell them all the things that you should be afraid of. Um, but on the other hand, if you read aspirin, you'd never take it. You know, I mean, you bleed into your gut, your head, blah, blah, blah. I mean, let's face it. You, and you can have an anaphylactic reaction and drop dead. So nothing is without side effects. And even if the side effect is one in a million, if you've got that one, that's all you care about. So that's why, you know, I feel like we're a team. And that's why I tell the parents these things, because if they see something, I want a phone call. So I think it's so important to educate, you know, the parents and to have everybody kind of, you know, communicate with each other. It's never perfect. Um, but it's not as simple, oh, this is the medicine that really does it when they're depressed. Um, I mean, lamigdal, many times it's an anticonvulsant. It can be very good in depressed kids, um, less likely to make them a manic, but that's not true for everybody. And lamigdal is associated with a side effect that can kill you, a rash that can kill you, which is not too good. So you don't wanna run there at all. But you, you know, it's all a matter of judgment, careful clinical judgment and familiarity with the literature. But God, I wish there were good studies looking at this. I mean, that's what we need, you know? Um, that is what we need. So um, one of the things that you identified in one of your blog posts was that children who had uh, psychiatric or psychological disorders before a tick-borne illness will have a different reaction to the tick-borne illness, meaning a different psychiatric or psychological reaction 
than children who did not have any psychiatric or psychological presentation before the TBI. What, why do you identify that as? I don't know that I said it that way because I don't think I could make that statement. I, I don't know. The truth is I don't know. I, so I'd be curious about the statement. But I will say if you have a psychiatric illness and you get the tick-borne illness, you know, I mean, it can be in any way. But like the ADD, many of these kids have ADD to start with, and then you get a tick-borne illness, and then the ADD looks worse. He looks more inattentive or whatever. Um, you know, so having a psychiatric illness early in childhood, anyway, it, it can really cause major problems. Um, so I don't know if it's a different manifestation um but it's definitely going to answer the problems in some way i mean so let, let's talk about what's happening um that's causing the um the psychiatric or psychological presentation right um is it is it the inflammation is it the infection is it immune to function is it all of the above. I mean, what is what is causing the 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 psychological or psychiatric presentation rather than one of the other physiological presentations? Well, if I could answer that uh, very specifically, I would win the Nobel Prize. Okay. Okay. So, but not yet. Um, but there's no question that there's a lot of evidence that uh, inflammation and immune dysfunction is playing a role in all these psychiatric illnesses. You know, when I was just treating bipolar kids, okay, before I got into this tick-borne stuff, the one thing I noticed is they had more sinus infections than other kids. And I, and I, I would ask my colleague this, because I'd be at bipolar meetings, you know, bipolar specialist meetings, and say, do you notice your kids get more sinus infections? Nah, not really. And then I read about pans and pandas and how basically the nose is full of lymphoid tissue and it's the gateway to the brain because things go in your nose and your sinuses. You have a small uh, area here called a cribriform plate and it's like a break in the blood brain barrier there. And so, you know, your immune system can communicate and get into your brain and follow, you know, your olfactory nerves or whatever. I mean, it just, I sat down and I said, so that's why I'm seeing what I'm seeing, right? Because I got a, a neuropsychiatric condition and these kids are getting these infections just in this area and it can go across the blood brain barrier, um, making sense. I mean, to me, that was like, whoa, I know I saw it. I just didn't know what it meant. So there's a gateway, there's a gateway to the bugs getting into the brain, right? And well, it's not necessarily the bugs, it's the immune system, different elements of the immune system. Because what happens many times, um, you're having an autoimmune reaction to the bugs. Okay. That your immune system, just as in um rheumatic fever and with strep. Um, there, the immune system mistakes um, an area in the brain called the basal ganglion, in, at least in pans, uh, for um, a protein that you see in the strep, and it attacks that area. Okay, so it, it's called molecular um, mimicry in that it looks like the body's makeup is similar to the pathogen or the bug's makeup you know, there's certain similarities in proteins. And so your immune system that likes to go after that bug will go after that part of your brain. All right. So in, that case, you... it, so in that case, it's immune dysfunction, right? Well, that's an important part of it. But there are cases where the pathogen does get into the brain. I mean, there are autopsies that have shown that. Yeah, that that's actually what I was just going to ask is yeah. because the, Alan there McDonald's has been... Yeah, there has been research that shows these infections in the brain. Mm -hmm. And how do you really know 
that it's autoimmune? Is that more a hypothesis or can you, can you really tell versus, Hey, you know what? Those microorganisms are in your brain and in causing those kind of reactions, much like you'd get an infection on your skin and you might get red or rash inflammation mm -hmm. and so on. Well, but I, I think, look, I think, um, People have different opinions and we don't know for sure. And to say it's in your brain, the only way we can prove it is by autopsy or brain biopsy. And most of us are not willing to undergo that. Um, on the other hand, there are tests like the Cunningham panel um, by molecular labs that looks for evidence of antineural antibodies. Okay, and that's going to show you if you have antibodies against, you know, your neuron own neurons. That's an example of autoimmunity. Okay, and, and so that's part of what, yeah, is being used in the diagnostic process. When is it bugs? When is it the immune system? When is it what percentage of what? We don't know yet. We know it does get into the brain in every part of the body. That so, is but are, aren't we seeing different psychiatric presentations based on different stimuli? So, for example, one of the things you studied uh, or you, you presented in one of your blog posts is the Dutch study where you, where you discussed the dose response relationship uh -huh. and, and, the, uh, and the seven or more infections, which increase the likelihood of suicide, right? I mean, because suicide is just such a you know, such a, a, a hot topic in the Lyme community now, and I guess it always will be, but at least the one study that you cited suggested that the number of hospitalizations mm -hmm. and the number of bugs that you have, seven or more, statistically okay. increases the likelihood of you committing suicide or having suicidal ideations substantially. Right, but all of this, remember, is going to affect your immune system and cause chaos within your immune system. And in studies looking at suicide, we do see that some immune markers are like sky high. Okay, so there is definite inflammation and definite changes within those brains. So are this are the seven the seven plus microbes triggering greater inflammation, or are the seven plus microbes triggering immune dysfunction because it's being overwhelmed or is it both nobel prize territory all right well i, I can't wait to be at your at your acceptance speech when you when you, uh, <laughs> when you answer that question uh, because uh, it, it's it's you know, covid has done us all a big favor it has done the line community a big favor because all of us in the line community when we started watching what was going on with covid we said that's what we see in our patients. And COVID is much more accepted. And we know that. So the people, more research will be done on that. We also know that many- Are you specifically COVID, talking about long COVID? Well, long COVID is, um, that's interesting because not just long COVID, I mean, I think the various, it, it is a multi-systemic, uh illness COVID itself and can cause cardiac damage and other long-term damage um but the long COVID and what it can do um with the various uh cytokines and immune markers is being studied and it, it is being studied to look for different patterns that may talk about types of intervention that you can do that could be very helpful. Um, there's this uh, Dr. Bruce Patterson um, who runs InCell Diagnostics. It's a lab, but he's come up with certain um, algorithms, for cytokine, um, what do you call it, expressions, certain ways to look at it that may help in terms of thinking how to treat it and um, um some of it he's approaching as if a treatment that would be somewhat like aids um so there's there's some great stuff out there 
and his work, you know, um, he's looking at lime and pans and pandas too. And that may give us more opportunities for intervention, especially cognitive intervention, which is what I care about with my guys. And, it, and he thinks that it could make a difference using the testing and using the approach. Um, and I'm sure there will be many other people that are gonna create you know, other ways of intervention. But I, you know, I, I think this is fascinating. It's great. And um, something, you know, to look at with my kids uh, as a possibility. Of course, a lot of people with COVID, they had a reactivation of their tick-borne illness. And they got very sick. And those of us in the tick-borne community said, it's a Bartonella. You know that that's what's going on and you know and there's no question i mean one infection causes another one to go you know so i you brought up bartonella a couple of times and I, I did want to discuss this with you before we begin to wind down and by the way debbie gets asked the final question but i want to ask my last last question um uh and that is we interviewed uh colonel nicole uh, malakowski who you are um, who is as Everyone I think in our community knows, you know, one, one of the bright lights in our community. No question. Uh, and one of the things that she shared with us was that when she was treated for the Bartonella, everything changed. And she became very vulnerable during the podcast. And she said uh, that she actually had suicidal ideations until she treated the Bart. And then once the Bartonella was treated, that was the game changer for her. Um, Nicole Bell, who's, who's also one of the leaders in the community, whose husband died from uh from tick-borne illness actually um wrote to us and said that that her husband's uh, uh the failure to treat her, her husband's bartonella was one of the reasons why he had so many of the challenges that he had and she likewise believed that it was the bartonella that was creating so many of the psychiatric issues that her husband was dealing with as well when we brought this up with some other llmds lyme litter medical doctors we were like oh they were like well wait a minute this microbe symptom connection specifically specifically psychiatric connection is not so clear that you know that bart rage it may not be bart rage it may be lyme rage it may be some other microbe so where do you fall on it do you think there is a way of connecting a particular microbe to a particular type of psychiatric or psych psychological response or do you do you fall more in line with um it seems like the mainstream lyme litter medical doctors where they're saying that you can have the same uh, symptoms with different microbes. Yeah. I'd be with, um, you know, the CDC and everybody, and we need good studies to separate out what goes with what. Because one, as my friend Bob Bransfield, a wonderful psychiatrist says, in this case, one and one doesn't equal two. One and one equals 11 because you have 11 different possibilities if you have those two microbes and well, that we, we, depends we, on your own genetics and everything else. But Dr. Greenberg, what I'm, what I'm, what I, I guess I'm arguing to is at least the patient population seems very comfortable with seeing a connection between Bartonella and rage. Yet the medical community is not so comfortable with those connections. And that's why that's the distinction I may, I may, maybe I didn't ask it so clearly. Why do you think there is such a clear distinction between you know, again, two brilliant, brilliant women. I mean, again, mm -hmm. talk about Colonel Malakowski, you know, the first Thunderbird pilot in U.S. history, yeah, she's combat amazing. pilot, unbelievably brilliant. Right. And, and she and she will she again, you don't want to, by the way, you don't argue with her because she could kill you. Right. She will. She'll tell you <laughs> Bart is it. Right. That's yeah, an N of one. OK, yeah. that's okay. a study of one. Yeah, it is. I agree. But, you know, but. You know, and I and I gave you another example, but I could probably give you many more. But I'm just saying. And you're sitting with you another mean. example. Yeah. But I'm not. I'm not saying that's not the case. I'm just saying scientifically, I don't think we can really say that we know for sure. And look, that's what you you want. You don't want people who are well until it's totally proven it's not true. You know, you want people, though, that do want proof of what they say, even more than 
the experience or the observations. You gotta get past the observation because there may be something else. Debbie, uh, look, my kids, most of them are bored. And who who doesn't count me? Everybody's suicidal. And I, I'm not making fun of them. I'm just saying they suffer. And and that's what happens. <clears throat> um, but in my mind, it's not so clear that this symptom causes this and this symptom causes that. I can't help it. I, I'm not so sure. And especially when you've got multiple interactive infections, you get 11, you don't get to. So, and, and again, the complexity of the body is such that I just, I don't know, that that is how I view it. Um, not that I don't say, you know, Bart's associated with rage, because I think we all do kind of see that. Um, but, you know, that's not the only thing. I mean, like, you know, if obesity really makes you depressed, I think it's it's fascinating. You know, everybody focuses online, but I think Bart and Babesia are really going to become much bigger players than people realize. Uh, we'll have to see. But so it depends on how you look at things. Some people are very comfortable saying, yeah, I've seen patients, this is it. It's like what I saw with the sinuses. I mean, I, mean, I couldn't exactly, you know, tell everybody, well, you know, sinuses are for sure part of these bipolar kids or whatever. And, but I saw something and I knew something. I just didn't know what it meant. You're seeing a lot of rage. You're seeing it more with Bart. But other people will have that with other tick-borne illnesses. Um. And what is that? It, it, um, I don't know. I'm just saying I don't know. Um, I find it interesting that more doctors in the past year or so are who are talking about PANS and all the psychiatric symptoms. I'm starting huh. to see it more more often fall under Bartonella, and as well as autism. So I, but that Ber had that shown that in Kinderler. Right, I know, I know, but go go by the community you look at, and and also people's mindset, their vision, what they're looking for. Okay, I see more bipolar kids than anybody, and some of it, I'm sure, is because I'm looking for it because it's so natural for me. Right, and it, so. It's it's the lens, right? I mean, you're looking through a particular lens in this particular population, and, and it may or may not transfer to a larger population. Absolutely. And, and this whole idea, like, look, I told Bob Bransfield, he had written uh, some articles on autism and tick-borne illness. I said, look, Bob, I really didn't believe you at the beginning until I started seeing it in the circus that had autistic-like symptoms and got treated and got better. Um. So there's no question that this is an issue with these types of infections. But the why is the specifics? I wouldn't be ready to commit. Let me put it that way. It's like, you know, you bet your money that ticks carry Bart. I mean, we found it in ticks. We found it in patients. We just haven't found that transmission except um, in a European study with uh what is it uh borrelia no not borrelia um oh i forgot well whatever it's in one study that they they had something possibly but we don't know okay we can't say if you ask ed breitschwert who is mr bartonella who's like one of the most amazing scientists you could ever meet i, I adore him because he's so smart but he's so careful and he says, you know, you can't at this point say factually that, you know, uh, ticks transmit Bartonella. I respect that. I really do. And, and to me, that makes sense. Gee, I would think so. I know I see it all the time. Um, but he's right.
we just we need to see the proof yeah and it, it, unfortunately the the i guess the most depressing part of any of the conversations that we have with experts is as much as we think we know about Lyme, we know very little about Lyme, right? I mean, we really know very little about this Absolutely. disease. And that's why so much of it has to be driven, you know, it, you know, by patients and parents uh, working together with a team of professionals so that we can identify, you know, the, 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 the most, um, you know, specific treatment protocol we can develop for any uh, for any person in this, you know, this very difficult community. So before I let Debbie ask you the final question, because you've been so kind uh, with your time and I and, and, uh, just love this conversation. And by the way, I love your accent as the child of someone who is from Brooklyn. I just love hearing that <laughs> accent. Um, so um, uh, we, we, uh, we, we would really love to, um, you know, find a way of having folks in our community uh, communicate with you and to work with you. So can you tell us about um, how folks can get in touch with you and how they can work with you and what contact information we can put on our, on our, on our webpage? We have a, a, we have a doctor resource page. We'd love to add you to it. Can you talk to us about how folks can get in touch with you? Um, my website, www.rosaliegreenbergmd.com. Okay. And, and do you, do you have any virtual formats that you use for folks who are uh, not in close proximity in New Jersey where they could work with you? You know, um, it, it's such a tricky issue with malpractice. Okay. So I can do consultations, but prescribing the medicine is a different story. So you're not supposed to unless you have a license in that state. Um, but I, I'm willing to work with other practitioners. I mean, that's fine with me. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And we're, we're going to uh, we're going to download information from your website and add that to our practitioner page. And you've just been unbelievably wonderful. And uh, I know folks are going to really be excited to work with you. So, Debbie, my wonderful co-host, can you please ask uh, the brilliant Dr. Greenberg our <laughs> final tick boot camp question? Sure. Be happy to. So talking to doctors who are new to this mm -hmm. or to parents who are new to this. How do you know when you get a patient who's got child who's got psychiatric symptoms? When is it that you start thinking, hey, this is tick-borne infections versus, hey, this is really just behavioral and or just generally psychiatric and would need just psychiatric meds? Well. You know, I, I've learned, like I said, everything, the history gives you so much. So some of it is what you're asking. I ask about everybody who lives in the household. Um, I wanna know about every animal that lives in the household. Um, and um, have they had ticks? Do they go outside? Does the family, gee, have you left the country? All of these things that perhaps in the past I might not have realized are very important in getting the history and also when people are coming to me you know they're from New Jersey and I told you Lyme is all over the place and so I say gee do you get deer on your lawn or your backyard oh yeah they're all over the neighborhood well okay and that means that's something I should probably test for just in case because Lyme is like syphilis, it's the great imitator. And so it can look like almost anything. So that may also come into play, but there, there are things, and then of course, pans or pandas more common that they have a family history of immune dysfunction. Somebody with thyroid disease or lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, again, I go through that in the history. So there are many different areas that I am looking at. So, and I have to say like, even in my psychiatric kids that I did find, you know, all these infections, I would be very strict in how I would diagnose bipolarity. To me, you've got to have a family history. If you don't have a family history, I question the diagnosis because that really runs in families. So all of the kids that I tested had the genetics for it, except for those that had been adopted. Although who gives up kids for adoption? Maybe somebody who is more loose, fun, you know, maybe having 
those type of uh, disorders. So, so Deb, I take all of those things. Um, it, you know, it, it's at a minimum, uh, probably just if I have a kid that's just ADHD, and it sounds like bread and butter. Well, first of all, they wouldn't come and see me, they'd be seen by the pediatrician. But if they did come and see me, um, you know, I might do lab core quests unless there's something. There's got to be something that makes me um, think I need to go looking for tick-borne disorders. Because I don't think our testing is as good right now that it's at the state that everybody should get it. I don't think so. I don't think we, we know enough for sure. And also the way the testing is, it's not worth it. I mean, you know, you just can't. You're going to send everybody to Wygenix or Galaxy or whatever. You can't. It's a lot of money. So you have to have that index of suspicion, you know, at least to go in that area. Well, I hope I answered that for you. That was perfect. And, and, and Dr. Greenberg, we can't thank you enough for spending so much time with us here at the Tick Food Camp Podcast. My pleasure. Thank you. It's been delightful being here. Thank you for listening to the Tick Boot Camp interview with Dr. Rosalie Greenberg. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you'd like to get in touch with Dr. Rosalie Greenberg, you can contact her at rosaliegreenbergmd.com. Second, if you enjoyed this episode of the Tick Boot Camp podcast, please share it with your friends by using the social media buttons at the bottom of your screen. Third, Tick Boot Camp has created a Tick Bite blueprint that's inspired by the wealth of information they've learned from folks in the community, just like me. You can find it at tickbootcamp.com. And please feel free to leave your comments. They really want to hear from you. Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on anywhere you get your podcasts. Matt and Rich really appreciate your past comments. So please reach out, leave them an, an honest review on Instagram or the website. Thanks for listening.